this is a Q&A session around this fantastic dorm that's going to hit screens very soon. Voice of Isolation. I'm Patrick Byrne. I'm going to be chairing tonight's Q&A session. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers. We've got Sunita Gale, the filmmaker, who will be talking a bit about the film that you've just seen, a small, a small extract of. We've got Natalie Barnes, who is the daughter and also campaigner uh, of the late Paulette Wilson, who's a close friend of mine. Uh, in the film, you saw Anthony Bryant, and he's here live and direct. Uh, and we've got uh, councillor Sonia Winifred, who is a cabinet member for Culture, uh, Lambeth Council, who's played a key role as one as an active councillor and also from the Winners' Generation herself. So we've got a series of questions as part of this Q&A session, but please put your questions in the chat. And uh, if we don't get carried away, we'll have opportunities to answer some of your questions as well. So um, I think you're all aware and familiar of the Windrush scandal, hostile environment policy that was introduced by Theresa May as part of the 2016 uh, Immigration Act, and which had devastating impact, particularly and disproportionately on the Windrush generation people from the Caribbean that came and also from Africa, but also it's had an impact on people from Africa, other Commonwealth countries. And also we now know that there's a second wave of the impact of the Windows scandal or hostile environment policy on the highly skilled migrants. A lot of them are coming from Southeast Asia as well. So we've got various questions which we can explore. I think one of the key things about the whole aspects of the Windows scandal, um, it's one of the very few times that a British government has apologised for its wrongdoings. Every, I mean, even now, after three years since we've had the scandal, the government still apologises. We've had three Home Secretaries, and um, Peter Patel, as you know, is the latest one, and she's always apologising. And she's and, and they all use this, use this expression of righting the wrongs, which actually really grills, frustrates me, because I don't think understand the concept of righting the wrongs. Wendy Williams was commissioned by the government, she produced a report over a year ago now called uh, the Lessons Learned Review, where she made 28, 28 recommendations on, and one of the key recommendations was essentially to review the hostile environment policy. And actually she, her views and review was that the hostile environment policy had a massive detrimental impact on the, the rights, the human rights of the Windrush generation and other uh, Commonwealth citizens. And more importantly, has, as we now know, over 21 people have died so far without even claiming their compensation. And, and many more people in the Caribbean and Africa have also died, but yet we still have that policy. So that's one of the things that we're gonna be exploring. The second thing is about the compensation scheme, which was launched in April 2019. It was heralded that victims of the Windows scandal would, not, would need to go to court and hire lawyers because they would, the money would be fast-tracked. They would get the money in good time. Two years on, and it's woeful. A recent report a few days ago by the National Audit Office basically made a damning indictment on the compensation scheme. Slow payments, additional bureaucracy, and on top of that, a lack of action to sort out this issue as well. So these are some of the issues that we're going to be exploring today. I just want to invite initially a Sunita girl, and I've got, I've got to know Sunita over the last, I don't know how long, 12, eight, 12 months plus maybe. Uh, and, and and I've been, you know, working, supporting her, this fantastic documentary she's working on. I just want to know Sunita, uh, just tell me what inspired you to make this film? And, and also why have you focused around hostile environment policy uh, in terms of making this documentary? So I think really the inspiration came from the fact that my parents came here post partition of India and Pakistan. When lockdown happened, you know, I became really reflective of my own childhood because all of a sudden we had to rely on our community and local support and the key workers, you know, the people working on the front line were the people that we really relied on. And my parents were both factory workers and I just felt like I, I needed to make a film to kind of on, honor people that, that kind of came, you know, um, post empire, post-war um, and came to the country to really work to build, to build our country. And so the inspiration of the film came from them really, and it still continues to be my inspiration. 
you know, my journey started off by making a film about immigration and the reliance of our country on immigrants mm. generically. And that really led me to the hostile environment. As I was filming, I was learning about stories from students from India, key workers working in the NHS. Um, and, and, it, and it kind of started to reveal my, to, my, to me that actually there was this, this policy, this, uh, the hostile environment that was literally a web of policies that I didn't, wasn't really familiar with the web of policies that were affecting them. And, and that kind of opened my journey to the, to the bigger story of the hostile environment. I mean, we all knew about the Windrush scandal that was very much out there, but I didn't know about the web of policies that are attached to the hostile environment and how the Windrush scandal really thrusted the hostile environment into the public domain. <laughs> behind the scenes, many things were manifesting. You know, people from uh, Southeast Asia, people from other countries were being affected by the hostile environment. And that opened my mind up to things like no recourse to public funds, which for anyone that's tier one to tier four visa in this country, anyone that has limited leave to remain does not have access to basically the welfare state or any services. And so anyone that is subject to becoming uh, undocumented or illegal or unable to access um, anything because they are subject to the hostile environment. It's cruel, it's really cruel. So my journey led me to kind of finding out more. So the film reveals itself with the Windrush scandal kind of seats us into the hostile environment, but then we learn about the hostile environment through students and through participants like Farouk Sare. Okay, great. Well We'll, we'll explore that a bit more. Uh, Natalie, uh, it's really great that you're here. Uh, I know it's really difficult being here, but it's really, really fantastic that you're here. Just tell us from your own experiences, um, the hostile environment policy, why do you think it's really important to remind the public that the Windows scandal is still happening and the impact of the Windows scandal on your family? Are you, you're on mute, Natalie. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Um, can you say that again for me, Patrick? Yeah, you're not talking at all. Just tell us from in your own words and your own experiences the impact of the hostile environment policy and why do you think we still have to remind the public that the Windrush scandal is still here? Obviously, for me, the hostile environment is very damaging. Um, the name in itself, hostile environment, for me, that's what they put people into. Um, my mum was put into that environment along with the other Windrush generation. And what I had to go through, like I said to you, the name alone made me feel like I was living in a hostile environment. Um, it didn't do very good for my family. It stressed out me, my mum and my daughter, and obviously it put my mum where she is right now, and I will still keep saying that. Um, I don't know, Patrick, it's just very upsetting to keep going on and talking about it. Um, we all know what is going on. Um, they say it's a hostile environment. Um, that to, to this day, they're still doing the same thing that they was doing when they started the hostile environment. Um, they're saying that they're right in the wrongs. The wrongs are still not being righted. Um, I don't know what else to say. It's mm. just, I think it's diabolical. I think it should be scrapped. Yeah. Uh, and I think we all recognise that, and that's why I think maybe that's the reason, maybe this film could help scrap that. Yeah, it needs to go. The name alone says it all. Sadly, it does. Thanks, yeah. thanks for that, Natalie. Uh, I'll move on to Anthony. Anthony, um, respect to you, sir. Uh, I've been a privilege to get to know you over the last few years. Um, I thought you might be in Hollywood by now, but you're still here in Edmonton, which is good. Just tell us in your... Uh, experience Anthony what does the impact of the hostile environment we saw the clips uh, in the film um, the BBC made a fantastic drama about your life what is the impact today for you and what needs what what more needs to be done just to remind the public that this still exists well as I, as I say I can only repeat um, what this young lady just said because you're still going through the same things. You're still going through the same thing. Nothing is finalized. I'm still waiting. And as you know, I'm still waiting for conversation while I feel that's so long. It's just campaigning. But we're always fighting. Fighting for something which should have been dealt with 
everybody says, as you said, they, they, they apologize. So from their apologizing, know that they're in the wrong. But yes, still be here, still here. Two years, near three years on, saying the same thing while saying a year, uh, a year, uh, two years, three years earlier. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, so it's, it is hard. It is hard. I can see where my girl is saying this is hard because she got her mom's gone and she's talking about it. It's just it reminds her of all that has come back to her. You know, so it, it's one of them things where. It, it, you want to fight, but then the fight is just squeezed out of you slowly. Every day, you know, it's hard. It's just hard to yeah. really put these guys. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Do you think mm -hmm. that, why do you think the government's not listening to that? What more evidence do you think the government needs to understand this situation? <laughs> Well, I, do, I believe so the government don't want to listen. They're just dragging their feet because 21 prisoners died. If me and um, the rest died, who's, they could just hand the, the offspring them or my sons them anything they want. Which is, you know, it's, it, is, it is ridiculous. It's getting ridiculous now. It's been three years now. It's about time to sort of me, Natalie, and all the people that was, was waiting for the, the compensation. Yeah. You know, people have the life to get on with. Sure. It's, it's just sure. a cloud of years every day. It's just a cloud of years. You, you know, you're waiting for this. And you didn't put yourself in a position, but you're still waiting for it. Home office is all at your life here. Yes. You know? Mm -hmm. you it's mad. Okay. Well, thanks. We'll come back to in, in a bit. Um, I just want to come up to uh, Sonny Winifred, as councillor, cabinet member. Uh, uh, Lambeth. Can you tell us, Sonny, from your perspective, uh, what's been the local authority response to the issue of the hostile environment policy? Do you think they have been part of the problem or part of the solution? Well, I'm hoping um, part of the solution, um, Patrick, because I think we know that uh, the largest numbers of people affected by this um, uh, live in Lambeth. So I think um, all councils, I might add, have a responsibility, have a role to play in supporting uh, people with no recourse to public funds. And this is, and, and some of the Windrush generation have found themselves as part of this. So emergency uh, financial assistance and uh, lobbying government to support them, uh, enabling them to make those applications and to feel confident when they apply to the home office that they won't be deported because I think that's one of the issues that's uh, uh, arisen where people are uh, you know, possibly not applying because the fear of being targeted for deportation. In Lambeth, we've been working with um, the Black Cultural Archives and um, Mackenzie Geese and Pope, providing um, legal um, assistance to, with their application forms. And um, I think it's important to do that. And um, at my insistence, we provided financial uh, support for this to take place. And um, I think um, it's, yeah, all authorities have that responsibility, but in Lambeth, as I say, we recognize our responsibility and myself and recognizing that um, as the Windrush generation, they're growing older and um, Anthony have said, and um, we've got Natalie, her mom has passed and people continue to, to, to die without the compensation. And it's just this neglect and, and deliberate. I think it's it's a lack of respect. It's contemptuous. And it really is um, upsetting. Um, it, people have come here and worked so hard and they deserve that. So, so in Lambeth, we've been supporting those people with no recourse to public funds and whether it be um, housing is, um, is an issue that's arisen with um, uh, the Home Office uh, sending people to the council for um, housing support and people are destitute with nothing, nowhere to go. So it's about providing that emergency support, emergency fund, emergency uh, housing support, support for those residents. And um, we will continue working with the Black Cultural Archives and um, uh, Mackenzie Butte and Pope. I think the COVID, the pandemic has put quite a strain on this for people and I think that's another issue around those people waiting for compensation, how they've been fearing during the um, COVID crisis. Um, so those, um, the, the surgeries uh, on the 22nd of May, 
Um, it reopened, but telephone um, support. But on the 21st of June, there will be face-to-face uh, -face, um, surgeries at the Black Cultural Archive. But, you know, Patrick, the, you know, going back to Lambeth, I feel we have a responsibility. We're aware of that responsibility, um, supporting, and again, um, reflecting on um, the generation, Windrush generations, and um, the compensation, types of compensation. The forms are incredibly difficult. Um, so it's having, and not everyone can um, access online forms or work with online forms. So it was for us to make it um, appropriate. I think I spoke with you, Patrick, in getting some of those hard copy forms available at uh, Lambeth Town Hall for people to, to access. And prior to that, myself writing a, a letter to all residents in Lambeth, everyone in Lambeth, to talk about the Windrush and to ask whether they feel they're eligible for this compensation and to come forward and um, support will be provided and not to fear um, this deportation because the legal advice will be there to support them. So we will continue doing that, Patrick, but I do feel um, there is the question as well, can councils provide, continue providing support for them, you know, in the interim, while people waiting for compensation, I think that's something that we need to consider. Yeah, okay, I've just got a, I've just got a, um, something to add there, actually, Sonia, which is uh -huh. that with the um, with the with the local authorities stepping in. I mean, obviously, there's been huge cuts right in the last decade, yeah. which really squeezed local authorities, and already mm -hmm. they're already mm -hmm. feeling that. So yeah. when local authorities are having to step in to kind of help people that have no recourse to public funds, you know, that's squeezing their budget even more. And I found that during my filming that actually local th authorities are actually at breaking point because they've lost that support from central government. They, and, and obviously central government are the people that are controlling these policies. You know, it just feels like local authorities and the people in their areas are the ones that are being hit the most. But one thing about legal aid as well is that people who are subject to the hostile environment don't have access don't to have legal access. aid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, they don't have, you know, the NRPF, you, you lose your right to rent, you lose your rights to work. You know, if you're subject to the hostile environment, these are the things that penalizes you. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just, you know, a consistent kind of upward battle to kind of try and make ends meet. So you're right, people become destitute. And that's the heartbreaking thing about the hostile environment. It is punishing and it is so cruel. And people are dying. 21 people have died without compensation. And Paulette, unfortunately, was the 21st. And I think that mm. something needs to happen. And it needs to happen now. It does. And just to add, I think that um, uh, councils, we all of us, uh, all councils have a key role to play in pressuring government, mm -hmm. government to move on this uh, process. I mean, it, it's it's far too long. This is ridiculous. And we, we, we sit here over and over again. And we, we, we um, it's like a revolving door. Um, so at what stage will they push things? Uh, will things get um, better? They will process these applications further. I saw in the chat, someone, just quickly a chat, someone said that, that the Wendy Williams review seems to be seems to have been forgotten. And there are there were, I think, 30 recommendations in that review. And I'm 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 in agreement. I think that's been totally forgotten. And as as the, the Windrush generation. Well a good might turn around and say, uh, no, of course we'll take this seriously. We have a cross-governmental advisor group of black people advising the government on this. We've got Windrush Day grants. What, what more do we want? Well, we have Does Windrush Day grants. What we want is justice for the Windrush generation. You want those people who are living to get their compensation so they can enjoy the quality of life and not wait, you know, until they pass. Because you, you may well ask, is this, is this a conspiracy? Is it intended? Why is it taking so long? Why are people not treated with the dignity and respect they deserve? Mm -hmm. uh, over to you, uh, Sunita. I just want to explore the film. What, what, I mean, obviously, there's lots of films that come out. Some films have a major impact on changing public attitudes and perceptions and changing, even changing laws. What do you want to achieve with this film around, around focusing on the hostile environment policy? Yeah, um, well... We have already um, aligned ourselves with several organizations 
um, like the, the Migrant Rights Organization, Migrants Organize, Doctors Association UK, JCWI, different organizations that are really supporting the impact campaign for the film. Stephen Timms, the MP that's been lobbying against No Recourse to Public Fund, yourself, Sonia, Natalie, Anthony. We, we really have um, so, solid organizations and people around us that want to support pushing the film. For me personally, um, I would like this film just to open more conversation about the hostile environment, to make people as a starting point at grassroots, at ground level, people within communities talking about the hostile environment. Part of our impact campaign will be to go into communities to have um, open sort of people's assemblies where we openly talk about the hostile environment and the impact of communities localized. So we want to build, the, the, we want to, we want to start a conversation to, to begin with. Uh, ultimately, um, we, we have been contacted recently by a large network of lawyers that want to take the film within several organizations across the UK and potentially Europe to actually showcase the film within law firms and get it within communities. So that's great. I would love to film the, the film, at, uh, show the film at Parliament with the help of Stephen Timms, uh, MPs from the left and from the right, as you know, mm -hmm. David Simmons supports you know, the hostile, you know, supports mm. action against the hostile environment. There what, are what, what about a private screen to Priti Patel? Do you think you can have one with her? Well, I'm still <laughs> waiting for her call back. Maybe, maybe she'll, she'll get in contact with me the night before the film release. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really to start the conversation, to talk about the policies around the hostile environment and, and to hope that with this film, we can make policy change. I really, after I've delivered the film, I then focus on the impact with all of you guys and start pushing this film with its impact. Okay, that's great. I mean, uh, in terms of impact, that's important. I mean, obviously there've been number like the classic film, Cafe Come Home, that focused on the issue of housing and homelessness in the 60s, that changed housing policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think your film, I'm not saying not, not too much pressure, yes, Nita, um, you know, big budgets and all that kind of stuff, do films have that impact? Does it evoke an emotional response to the public? Uh, I mean, three years ago, um, you know, you know, the petition I did, uh, articles written by Amelia, the Caribbean diplomats raising issues, charities like JCWI, Praxis, Romy Trust, did sh help to contribute to shifting attitudes. But the government is still adamant that hostile environment policy is still there. Mm. No, that's Have a good question. I think that what's happening now, we've seen for the past year, since unfortunate passing of George Floyd, a real surgence of people taken to the streets, protesting, people coming together. I was recently attending uh, a protest about the police bill. And what I saw on that day was the Extinction Rebellion with Black Lives Matter, with unions, with MPs, people from the left, people from the right, people with varying views coming together to fight back against the system. I think as a starting point, communities of different ethnic backgrounds, different class, whether you're conservative or Labour, need to come together and really, you know, work to, to strategize how we can try and change the hostile environment. If we start pushing the narrative, pushing the story, then maybe, yes, we can change policy. As I said, I'm putting my energies into policy change, working with MPs like Stephen Timms. Um, I've already asked for a meeting with Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Priti Patel. I'm still waiting for the call, but I will not stop until I at least get in front of a significant number of MPs, again, from the right and from the left to talk about this hostile environment and really show them firsthand, you know, the case studies, the material, and hopefully we will be able to enact change. I, I want to do that, but okay. I can't say right now I will, but I'm gonna try my damn hardest. Okay, well, don't worry, we're all behind you. So this is a question, so this question is for all the panel. Um, and the question is, uh, again, about the hostile environment policy. We've, we saw uh, the clip of, um, of um, Farouk, who is a highly skilled migrant. And there's, in many ways, there's another, there are more and more window scandals brewing and happening as we speak. Um, what do you think, I mean, the government have rebranded the hostile environment policy. It was now, it's now called a compliant policy. In your experience and what you know what do we need to, what do we need to do to get rid of the policy environment policy 
And what what is the legacy or the scars of that today? Um, let's start with you first, Anthony, from your experience. You have, you've had two spells of detention uh, in Yarnswood and you're still here, which is fantastic. Do you think the detention centres like, like your experiences and the whole rigmarole around the policy and the way that you've been treated, that's, obviously that should be got rid of, but how do you think that should be get rid of? And what is the scars of that for you? Are you, you you're, um, you're still muted? I beg your pardon. Don't worry. Yeah, I, the scars is that I got locked up twice. I didn't do nothing. I, I got locked up, but you know, in the stress I had to go through with them things there, you know, and just day to day life. I just I have to be asked to the missus for this, asked to the missus for that, because you can't really do nothing. You can't, you know, that was just stressful because I'm used to getting my own things and and then see, I'm gonna find out I was sick with the CPOD and all them stuff. And then this is bring on a whole heap of stress on me. And so it was, I didn't know I can't work and them things. So, you know, so it was all, it's all heap of, it's all heap of things. It's, they think that when they give this conversation that even now that's gonna just solve everything. No, no, it won't. It will solve things like you pay your bills and things where you still have the stress. You still uh, have the paranoid and still you still have the illness mm -hmm. where it brings the stress brings on. And I just and I I got this thing of knocking doors. So if somebody come and knock the door too hard, I'm I'm there sweating and things like that. And yeah, and it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of things. It's a lot of things. Yeah, it's a lot of things, but yeah, you know. Yeah, I know that because you know I've I've got to know you and I've got to know some of the windrushers and their families mm -hmm. and you know, I've worked in mental health and the expression is post traumatic stress that a lot lots of people are, have experienced post traumatic stress because of the I mean actually I, I think it's a public health issue and but it's not a public health issue, think, think it's think it's issue. Uh, it's to be honest man. yeah yeah I think we, all of us could do a bit be a counselling because stress is a big thing you know it's a mm -hmm. big thing. It was a very big thing. And when I was taking out some of my stress on the missus as well, and she stressed. It's, it's a, it, 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 not one thing can explain it. It's a, it's a, a, a it just yeah. keeps on going and going. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm talking to you, I'm sweating. No, so I'm, I'm, remem I'm remembering all the, all the things I've been through. Yeah. yeah, I know it's difficult. I know. Uh, Sonia, um, as a campaigner and as a local politician, why isn't Priti Patel listening to all this stuff? What more evidence does she need to know that it's not working? Or is, it, well, is, she, is she more concerned about the opinion polls and <coughs> what? Well, Patrick, I think that's a question for Priti Patel. Um, she uh, obviously, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, it's a question for Priti Patel because um, throughout the, you know, the, this uh, hostile environment, we've been lobbying, <clears throat> lobbying her, lobbying the government, and um, there's no movement. But I just feel that um, there is uh, now a community or a nation, a uh, Windrush generation, who distrust the Home Office, um, the new immigration laws, the coming in, it's the designed to alienate people. And it's interesting you said you call it the compliance policy, compliant for whom? And um, it, it's, it's the trauma that people are carrying. Um, the trauma of uh, leaving your home to begin with, arriving here. Some people, the trauma of racism, discrimination, the inequalities, and then the additional trauma of this uh, hostile environment. And let's not forget that uh, the changes the Immigration Act was a deliberate uh, attempt. Uh, it was a deliberate act in the hope that people's lives would be so difficult that they would leave. They would, you know, pack up their bags and leave, hence the hostile environment. So I think um, back to, to, to the government, we continue to pursue, to, um, to, to lobby, to discuss situations, uh, individuals' uh, uh, experiences from our borough, um, 
yeah, we, we remain a welcoming borough. And, and I think local authorities, as been said, continue to do all they can to welcome our um, uh, immigration people and to support the Windrush generation. I'm, you know, I don't have the answer to that, Patrick. Um, it's, it's politics, isn't it? A lot of politics at play and re, uh, just um, setting aside, casting aside people's feelings, people's lives, people's experiences. It's degrading, it's demoralizing, and it kills. Yeah, but, but the recent report that came out by um, Tony Saw basically mm -hmm. said that it's not an issue, it's not a problem, you know, about hostile environment policy. It's all about aspiration. You, you've, got the wrong, you've got the wrong mindset. You should be working hard, doing well, and you'll be all right. So does that mean that Windrush Generation didn't work hard? Did they not work hard? Did they not do well? And what's happened to them? They were told you don't belong. You know, despite well, you working it. hard, despite your earning a living, despite mm -hmm. your, your standard of living, you don't belong. So I don't understand this report. I don't claim to understand it. I don't agree with it. Yeah. I heard you there, Anthony. Yeah. Were you, is there anything you want to add to that? Huh? Well, I thought I, I work hard because I've been working from hour 15. Mm. And, I'm, and until they told me I can't work. Mm. Uh, through the uh, change of status, that just messed up my whole my whole my whole life. This in yeah. hostile environment and yeah, and for me the land out you have to check your, 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 your if you have your passport and then before you can rent any place. All them things just made my life misery because I, I I didn't have no idea as you know. Sure, and, you know. As I say, a lot of people, a lot of black people out there need counselling. They yeah. might think that they don't, but they, they do. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stress, a lot of people going through it. Mm -hmm. And not just, not just people who's been locked up like me, people yeah. like my missus who's been inside me because I'm stressed. I give her stress. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. wanting to, but you're stressed. You know, the love runs around you. You seem to stress, give them stress. Yeah. The whole family, isn't it, Anthony? Yeah, yeah. The whole family stress. The whole family stress. Because yeah. you may not know that how that person checks for you until mm. you're going through that to yeah. yourself. Because, yeah. as a matter of fact, I, I get a lot of people now who I check for, who I, I didn't even check for before because I didn't know so they had that feelings for me. Sure. Yeah, I'm going through that. So there's a lot of good people you, see, you meet going yeah. through that. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. so in that sense, yeah, that was a bonus for me, but you know, it, I had to be going to stress to meet them. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah naturally, um, I, I know you, you, may, you may want to comment or not, but what do you think the impact of the hostile environment has on future generations? If this policy is still there, how is it going to affect future generations of young people, uh, either in your family <clears throat> or in Wolverhampton, et cetera? Well, the young generation, now I speak to a lot because I work in a school, obviously. So the young generation do ask me a lot of questions and they are very clued up and they do understand what's going on. But yeah, this, is, this can't continue. We don't want uh, the next generation to be scared um, to be thinking that, their family members are going to be taken away from them. You know, like what I said, like Anthony said, um, going through it, it's very stressful. It, it, it mashes up the whole family. Um, so no, we don't want uh, generate the next generation to be living like how we live in. We want to just all come together and just live in peace. Like, I don't get why we have an host a hostile environment. Like um, Sonia said, we come, uh, the generation come here to build up the country and then they want to send them um, back years later. I just don't understand it, Patrick. You know my view on this. I just, it's very confusing. Um, for me, nothing ain't changing. It's still the same. I'm glad that we've got this option to do this now and it, it needs to change. We don't want our second generation to be going through what we're going through. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, so to the audience, we've got a number of minutes left before we finish. And if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. We've got some questions already. Uh, so we've got one question about the um, 
um, the Wendy Williams review. Actually, on my bookshelf, here it is, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the report. And this is quite important because um, for Natalie and for Anthony, do you remember what we did a year ago? Do, mm. Can anyone remember what we did a year ago? Parliament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not quite Parliament. A year ago. Downing what did Street. we do? Downing Street. Yeah, Downing Street. Street. Yeah. Dropped off our petition. And petition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 139,000 yeah, 139, people signed the petition to say to the government, you need to implement this report. Do you mm -hmm. think that this report, is, as we speak, has been implemented? I'll start, I'll start first with Sunita. Do you think this report has been implemented or considered seriously? Well, I think there were no lessons learned from the from the Wendy Williams review, and that's the problem, right? Is that they, we now have the next, unfortunately for me to, unfortunate that I'm saying this, the next Windrush scandal, which is in the works, which is happening, and that is to do with highly, so-called highly skilled migrants. Um, what is happening now with migrants that are here, migrants that our country are welcoming because they have a particular skill level, because they can come here and do those, you know, engineering jobs or IT jobs or scientific jobs or medical jobs. But when they're here, you know, they, they put them on a 10 year track and that 10 year track started in 2012. It's now coming up in 2022. So Next year is going to be a big year for this 10 year track. And what happens is every two and a half years, you have to pay a lot of money, thousands of pounds. And if you're a family of four, tens of thousands of pounds, you know, Fruxa is one person out of thousands of highly skilled migrants in our country that are suffering because no lessons have been learned from Wendy Williams report. And, and how that's manifested with Farouk is that he's tens of thousands in debt. His children that were born here, and Natalie and Sonia and, and Anthony, how, as you've been talking about the next generation, they were born here. They are subject to the hostile environment. They too have to renew their visas. They are on limited leave to remain. So, you know, the government on one hand, it's completely um, uh, just, I, I can't understand why this is happening. On the one hand, they want migrants to come here but on the other hand they want to bleed them of all their money they want to stress them out give them mental health issues uh stop them from working basically squeeze them of everything until they become so defeated and so deflated they either leave themselves or they get deported so we have a situation now where unfortunately i believe that the next windrush scandal will be the highly skilled migrant scandal where we're going to see thousands of highly skilled migrants basically destitute because they came here to work they had a dream and they are leaving this country tens of thousands in debt and unable to survive and that's exactly what's happened to Farouk right now so unfortunately the government aren't listening to these reviews they aren't taking action and they're continuing to let this happen and i and i and i think you know it's it's time to say to Priti patel who by the way her parents came here as asylum seekers they fled uganda and they came here and worked in and had a news agent my parents were shopkeepers too we come from the same cloth and yet she doesn't understand the fight that our parents had to go through and the struggle and where she she was put in that position because of the, her parents' fight. And it's just sickening to see that. Um, I just wanted to put that in there, but I feel there, were, there are no lessons learned, Patrick. And it's very sad. It's very upsetting to see. So why, so why does she keep on repeating that we have learned the lessons, we are doing great stuff. And then she, she actually uses her backstory. She talks about the, the, that she's had to work hard and do well. So she, she said, I'm a model of success. What, what are you moaning about, Sunita? Get on with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, she's refused to kind of answer the questions around her parents. Um, and yeah. she said, what's not to do with that? That was a different era. That was a different generation. Yeah. In fact, what has happened in 2021? We have a new Asylum and Refugee Act. We have a new points-based system. The points-based system, as she describes it, we are looking for the brightest and the best to come to our country. We do not want to have low-skilled migrants. We want those that fit a particular points-based system. Are we making this society a points-based society where we're selecting 
the people that come here. And by the way, when we select them to come here, we will bleed them dry of all their resources and then we'll send them home penniless. That is exactly yeah. what this points-based system is about. And yeah. in fact, it's, it's getting word, more hostile and it's very concerning that this is even being allowed to happen. So the more we push back, the more we gather leaders like yourselves and councillors like Sonia and local authorities that are saying no, the more we can make change. Because unfortunately, where we are today, no lessons have been learned. And in fact, the hostile environment, which was rebranded to the compliant environment in 2018 by Sajid Javid, is getting more hostile. And we need to stop them from doing that. Gotcha. Uh, Anthony, do you think that um, they are implementing this report? If not, why not? The only person who's looking at that report is people like me, you, and, uh, and who's going through this kind of thing. I don't think the media or the government is taking no notice of that report at all. It's not in their interest to, to do that, so I don't think they're doing that. And that's a pretty Patel. Why should she? Why, why is she, she, she's, you know, she's not going through not a stressful thing. She's going to the back of her house with her family, nice and easy. She and Ben Johnson, why should they read them kind of report? The only person who read them kind of report is me, you, Natalie, and the people that was going through these kind of things. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sonia, um, obviously I know that you've, you've read the report and you've had, you've had a number of conversations with other politicians about the report, there's a cross-governmental advisory group chaired by Bishop Webley. Do you think that's making a difference? No. I don't see the difference that it's made. I mean, um, if you go back to the report, I mean, I, I recall two of those, it was 30 recommendations. I recall two that stuck to my mind. I mean, they're all important, but the um, recommendation number 29 around the government should review its diversity and inclusion um, policies or training and, and unconscious bias and to deliver training to, 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 to for people to better understand diversity. And I seem to recall several government ministers were up in arms refusing to take that training because they felt they didn't need it. So that alone tells you that they're not interested. Um, they don't want to have that narrative. And also, um, uh, recommendation number 29, I believe. Uh, sorry, was it 27? No, I said 29 was that one. 27 around the government should set up a, a um, establish an overarching strategic uh, race advisory board. So I don't see this, what you've mentioned, as this advisory board because it was to, to include external bodies to discuss immigration so that collectively people, community come together of voices from the community, talk about those immigration um, situations affecting the Windrush generation, their children, and those people, Sunita mentioned, uh, uh, refugee asylum seekers, people who, um, uh, who have a life here, their children, and are, are at risk of being deported. So I think, I don't think any of that's been um, pulled together. Um, we know this government um, are very good at um, reviews, reports, and then rather than implement, they, they um, um, then set up another one, which best suits their thinking. Okay, Natalie, is there anything that you want to add to that? Not really, I'll just keep it short and sweet. Me personally, I think that the Wendy Williams um, review has been blatantly ignored. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think many things come out of what she's written down and it's pretty sad, but she tried hard with that. Okay. Patrick, can I just add, if um, Natalie said something earlier around the younger generation, and it's absolutely fundamentally that is happening now. The younger generation are being impacted by this because their families, their parents, their aunts, their uncles, they've been um, um, affected by it. And this uh, mental health, the trauma that's been spoken about, we see it, it, it it's, it's going from generation to generation. In COVID, the lockdown, has somehow reared its head and it's really highlighted what people are going through. And it wasn't just lockdown, it's what the lockdown has initiated, the lives people are living, or the lives they're unable to live because of overcrowded, poor housing, lack of um, um, uh, proper health um, care. 
so you know it it continues it it it's yeah it, it's diabolical it's this it's black it's the black community that are constantly being targeted constantly the changes we talk about changes but realistically on the ground the change is not happening some people will disagree but i want to see if there is change show it to me it's got to be it's got to happen a lot faster and people mention the black lives matter movement that's been fantastic yesterday it was a year um, the killing of um, george floyd and we all saw this in our living room and that's what the difference was everyone people came out together to, to march to protest against inequalities. And it's brilliant that the narrative still continues and our young people are part of that narrative. It's brought them out, but they need help. They mm. need that support. No, absolutely. Uh, anyway, we're coming towards the end. There, in the chat, there's a question about, uh, someone says um, they're feeling ashamed about what the government's done and are there any legal assistance and costs? Just to answer that question, there are no, I mean, obviously there's no legal aid to support people. Mm -hmm. There are a number of lawyers and wonderful organisations and community groups coming together to provide services. I've worked with Natalie in Wolverhampton to establish the Maureen Mitchell and Windrush Clinic. There's, Tony talked about the work of the council's work with BCA, uh, but there is no proper support, financial, legal assistance costs at all. And that's, and which means that there's, it reduces access to justice. There's another message uh, is uh, um, is about uh, a group of artists who are engaging with uh, young people from the global minorities to have their own space called Culture Club to learn about and to, lust, to learn, discuss, and activate, which sounds really good. And when you're ready to end, say goodbye. And okay, that's fine. That's the Culture Club. So, um, Sunita. Um, how, when's the film going to be ready and how can people access this? Mm -hmm. So the film, well, we're currently editing the film. What, what people saw tonight was a sort of rough cut of the scene. So we're currently editing. We're hoping to have the film finished kind of in the middle of the summer. And then our, you know, our strategy is to put the film through festivals and to see where we land. I mean, I want to get the film out into communities. For me, I want it to be within communities <laughs> spread the word so I'm thinking about an impact distribution strategy particularly here in the UK um, with localized communities and localized screenings and working like I said with law firms particularly to to spread that message so the film will be finished in, in mid-July hopefully um, I have one final word to say about generally about the hostile environment and and the future of the hostile environment you know the Windrush scandal, as I said, brought it to the forefront. We now have the so-called highly skilled migrant scandal. But what we're seeing now is a hostile environment really reverberating to people from the U from Europe. You know, EU nationals now are told that if you don't have sexual status, you can go home. People from the EU that are coming home for, for interview that don't have a particular visa are being detained. We're seeing it more and more now that since Brexit, you know, we're, we're having this hostility turn get amongst, against the European community. We're also seeing with this 2021 um, uh, um, Asylum and Refugee Act that Priti Patel is now making a distinction between those that are trafficked and those that are not. So those that are trafficked, you're not welcome to come here, go home, we don't want you. But those that are not, well, we'll welcome you with open arms. How do you differentiate that? A person that travels by water that's fleeing persecution is pretty much deemed as trafficked. So the hostile environment is now working its way into other communities. And recently with the police bill, the hostile environment is now saying, you know what, we're gonna scoop you all up and we're gonna tell you all right now, you don't have a right to protest. You know, Gypsy and Roma people, you don't have the right to roam, you don't have the right to travel. So we're seeing now the legacy of the hostile environment permeating throughout our society. And that's my concern, not only as a filmmaker, but as a human being. So we, like you said, we do need to group together, gather, build a movement, fight back from all communities and really change this narrative. Um, and that's my final word. Thank you. No problem at all. So we're coming to the end, everyone. Uh, it's really great. So this is a fantastic film, Voices of Isolation, everyone. When it comes out, support it. 
this film is not just a film, it's a social campaign. It's a mass movement to work towards scrapping the hostile environment. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is um, I've been involved in doing various petitions. My latest petition, which I've put in the chat, is about removing the Windrush compensation scheme from the Home Office. It's not working, it's failing people, like Natalie and her family and Anthony and his family and other families around the country and, and also internationally as well. We need the scheme to be removed from the Home Office to be managed independently and a proper support care and support package to support the Windrushes and their families. So please sign the petition. So far, 60,000 people have signed it. What I'd like to happen, and this is all about impact again, um, I would like to get about 100,000 signatures before Windrush Day. And I want Natalie, Anthony, and some of the Windrushers, again, we're, we're gonna go down to number 10, to, number, to Boris's yard, and say enough is enough, and to do your job, and to remove the compensation scheme. So who's gonna <coughs> join us at number 10, just before Windrush Day? I wanna get there a week before Windrush Day, and sign the petition, send it to your networks, and let's make something happen. I just want to thank very much Sunita Gale, filmmaker, and her team, a fantastic team who's, who's behind this. Natalie, Natalie Barnes, thanks very much. Anthony Bryant and Janet, who's behind in the kitchen making making dinner for him. Rest in peace. Oh, there you go, Jack. Nice one. Respect. Brilliant. Uh, and and Councillor Sonia Winifred, who has been an uh, active campaigner for the rights of the Windrush generation, not just in Lambeth, but the work that she does across London and nationally uh, as well. So, Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Can I just quickly say, that now that you, you're bigging me up around Windrush, that for Windrush Day, please, everyone, look up our, on our website, Lambeth website. Our theme this year is We Are Here. So all the stories, intergenerational, what it means to be here. I am here, here to stay. This is my life, and I'm not going anywhere. Thank We're you. not going anywhere. This is no. our home. We are. And, here. and we have to make sure that people yeah. who see this as their home, that we fight the hostile environment policy yeah. and as well. So on this note, thank you very much for everyone who's participated tonight. This is just the start of a journey with this film. The film's going to go global and we're going to make it happen. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Anita, Natalie, Anthony, Janet, Sonia. And everyone and the team behind putting together the Flatback Festival at the last tonight. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye.